Well, good morning. We welcome everybody here to Mount Harvest Church, and uh, hopefully you got some on the way, and then we, those that are watching, so let's uh, sing a couple of songs, and those here help us. church that was part of the First Baptist Church, and uh, I remember the pastor, Jesse Bemis, and uh, last I know, he still lived down in Texas, and uh, he looked to be about 70 years old, and that would have been about uh, uh, 50 years ago, and, uh, but he, he could work on Volkswagen, he loved Volkswagen. He pulled the motor out in 10, 15 minutes, you know, just tinker with them and all that. And uh, just, uh, he was the one that he didn't let us kids get by for a whole while. And, uh, you know, when you got a lot of kids, teenage kids, and, uh, and there's a lot of girls, a lot of boys, and... <laughs> You know how it is, you like to sit together, you like, and and me being from Galax, and part of them was from Carroll County, the only time we'd see each other would be like on Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday nights, or every Bible. And they did more than one time that he's called me out and said, you want to come up here and read that note? Oh, no, you better be quiet. I'm going to have you come up here and read that before everybody. 
Now you talking about getting you quiet real quick. <laughs> but he, I remember and and just uh, fond memories of, uh, even though he was quick to get me. It's like me, I was raised in church, and then I stepped out into the world for several years. And uh, I know when me and Randy got married, we'd been married seven years, and we was about to end on our road. And uh, Randy's uncle said, y'all come to Fireman Church. Said, y'all like it up there. And Randy, Roland worried the heck out of him. Randy said, well, we going to go to church this Sunday just to shut Roland up. Well, as soon as I went to church, I give my life back to the Lord. And he knows he was in trouble then. And then the next Sunday, Chancey got saved. And the next Sunday, Randy got up next to the wall. They were, he was sweating bullets. And he turned his life over the bullets. We've been in church ever since then. So uh, it's a good thing. Yeah. You know God knows you.
say that yesterday uh, we took part with <coughs> Drusilla Sawyers in her uh, burial. And uh, of course, she, when she passed away Monday morning, she automatically went to be with the Lord. And uh, I had never been, I've been to most of the funeral homes down there in Mount Airy. And this was the first time that I had been to uh, Spencer's funeral home. And I will say they did a superb job. Um, taking part and making everybody feel comfortable and welcome. And uh, uh, there at the gravesite, they had three uh, doves, white doves that they released in honor of her. And uh, it was just a real good uh, ceremony. Of course, got to meet her pastor that was down there, uh, Reverend uh, Carl Small. And uh, we we got a lot in common, me and him. And uh, uh, he 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 was a little different. I was raised in Baptist, and he was raised in pet, uh, primitive Baptist. And then uh, God got dealing with him, and uh, he's non-denominational now. And I said, "Well, that's the way we are." I said. You know, it's not the denomination that's going to get you into heaven. Right. It's it's knowing Jesus Christ. Right. And if you know Jesus Christ, then that's what's important in life. Uh, you know, our Bible is our guideline and everything. And y'all remember mm -hmm. their sons, Dustin. Yeah, remember their sons, Both Dustin, DJ, and Dutch keep them in prayer. So, all right, got your Bible. Let's do a confession of faith here. Those that are here, those that are watching, you say it like you mean it, mean it like you say it. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am what says I am. I am what, what says I am. I have what says I have. I have what says I have. I do what says I do. To do it today, I'll be taught. Today I'll be taught. The, word the Word of God. I boldly confess. I boldly confess. confess. My mind is alert. My mind is alert. And my heart's receptive. My heart's receptive. I'm about to receive. I'm about to receive. Incorruptible. 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 Indestructible. Indestructible. Never living seed. Never living seed. The Word of God. The Word of God. I'll never be slain. I'll never be slain. Never, never, never. Never, never, I'll never be saying in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, we're going to start with Matthew, and we'll probably end up in Mark. I mean, we don't have that many chapters to go through or many books. We'll go through three of them. I know nobody's got no as any, any rush. Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 9, we'll cut out the first eight and go to chapter 9. And uh, if you're taking notes, the title is Throne, Throwing God or Touching God. Now, which is the most important? Do what? Throne. Throwing. Yeah, throwing, you know, pushing, getting close. Which is most important? And I'll, I'll say this also. You know, most people don't realize that when you miss church, you lose. There is something about corporate worship that God wants us to have. It just, uh, it, it builds your, your church family is very important to be with you and to be with them. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's, I'll just use Sister Drew for an example. When she left Galax, she went down to Winston-Salem, and she stayed down there uh, for quite a while, and then she went back up with her sister in Mount Airy, and uh, I had never got to meet Pebbles. I'd heard of her, and uh, finally got to meet her, and uh, uh, she's a very um, uh, good person. I mean, she just spirit-filled and loves the Lord, and and she really uh, helped Drew. But I would, when, while Drew was down in Winston, there would be times that we would correspond back and forth uh, through Facebook. 
And uh, it wasn't an everyday thing. It might be once a month, once every six months, but I keep tabs with her. And, and uh, uh, that, you know, I always try to keep up with them. I, you know, we've got church family that's as far away as Olympia, Washington. I keep up with them. I've got We've got church family that's in Clyde, High. I keep up with them. I've got church family uh, down in Florida we keep up with. Uh, and, uh, I mean, we've got people that's been here that's moved out of state and, and we keep up with them. And as always, uh, it's keeping in touch with your family. And uh, I've got blood family that I try to keep up with. They may not keep up with me as much as I try to keep up with them. All right. Everybody got turned to Matthew chapter 9. Let's read. In verse 18, while he spake these things unto them, Behold, there came a certain ruler. Now, now, as always, I want you to pay attention to the wording because the wording is very important. A certain ruler and worshiped him, saying, My daughter is now dead. But come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him, touched the hem of his garment. For she said with in herself, I want you to highlight that in your Bible. For she said with in herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Father God, as we read your word this morning, Give us the insight, the ability to understand the difference, and Lord, to be able to touch you. Lord, just to open our eyes that we can see the difference so that we can receive the blessings, Lord God. And so, Lord, just be with us by the Holy Spirit that is with each and every one here and those watching, that it will impact their life, Lord God, to give you honor and glory. So, Lord, have your way in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. Now, we see that this woman said within herself, within herself. That's something that we're going to mention over and over. I want you to go to Mark chapter 5 right now. In Mark chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 22 through 33. Or 34. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. Now, notice Mark is putting a name with the person that came to Jesus. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter. Now it's not just his daughter, it's his little daughter. Life at the point of death. Now, Matthew said she was dead. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. 
and Jesus went with him, and much people followed him, and mark this, thronged him. In other words, they were pushing against him. Verse 25, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. I mean, those people that's got worse instead of better. And when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment, came in the press, in other words, the people that were throwing Jesus, and touched his garment. Verse 28, I like this. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she fell in her body, that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee? I like that. And saith, who touched me? How I did. And I said, how in the world you won't know somebody touching you? Everybody's pushing against you, Jesus. And you won't know who touched you? And Jesus looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembled, knowing what was done, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now, you know she called her daughter. She's part of the family, part of God's family. And whether you know it or not, by her coming forward, the religious people would have stoned her to death because anyone that had an issue of blood was basically like a leopard. You better not touch them because you would be counted unclean and you'd have to offer a sacrifice and isolate yourself for seven days. And that's why she feared because what is a religious group going to say? Let me throw this in. How many of y'all, I know we got a lot of young people and I know most of these young people's never been in church where women didn't wear makeup or earrings or anything. Because back many years ago, if a woman come in and they was had makeup on and red lipstick on, they was the, of the devil and they were going to hell. But I thank God that we got makeup us men could use some of it every once in a while. Amen. I, I'd rather my wife be decorated and uh, everything than to uh, uh, go around and be saying, Oh, Lord, oh, Lord Jesus, going to scare somebody to death. I ain't going down the house. Mm. <laughs> so that's just free. See, the church has come to the senses. You know, it, it, you know, this is the way people think. Amen. People, it, it's not what's on the outside, it's what's on the Amen. inside. And that's what this woman had. She had something on the inside of her that showed up on the outside that changed her. And, you know, uh, you go back to the old Pentecostal churches that I was talking about, and, 
and women had to wear dresses all the time and no slacks and no makeup and everything. And that did not keep them from sin. They still sin. The religious is always trying to put you in a box and hinder you from walking with God. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 8. Now, you're going to say, how come we're looking at the same thing? You know, Jesus had four of them to write, and all of them had a different perspective. All of them wrote it a little bit different. Now, how many knows that we can all look at one thing and all of us see something different? We can all, you know, if you on Facebook much, you'll always see people posting things. Well, how many faces do you see? What do you see? Do you see this? Do you see that? And some people will recognize things that are different. Now, in Matthew chapter 9, uh, Luke, uh, Luke, 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 <laughs> Luke chapter 8, had me turn to the wrong chapter my own said. Luke chapter 8, we'll start with verse 41. And behold, there came a man named Jairus. He was a ruler of the synagogue. So they've really getting a little bit more explaining everything or who and all that. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come to his house for he had only one daughter or had one only daughter about 12 years of age. And she lay down. Now, how many knows that if you've got a child and as a parent, you're going to do everything you can to see that your child gets help Amen. or their help. And so I can just imagine Jairus trying to get Jesus to come with him. Now we find out instead of being just his daughter or little daughter, she's a 12-year-old daughter. But as he went, people thronged him. Or again, I like that. And a woman having the issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all for living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment. Touched the border of his garment. In other words, now specific where she touched. And immediately her issue of blood staunched. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee and sayest thou who touched thee? And Jesus got to explain. Somebody hath touched me for I perceive the virtue is gone out of me. Jesus said when somebody touched me Everybody been pushed against me, but nobody touched me. They thronged me. They pressed me, but nobody had touched me like this person did. Because when this person touched me, I felt something go out of me. See, that's the difference between pressing and thronging God versus touching God. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling, falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people what caught, 
for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be a good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Hallelujah. Now, as I said, we've read all three. And I want you to go back to Matthew 22. Or Matthew chapter 9. Verse 22. Hallelujah. Or actually verse 21. For she said within herself. You see, there's something different about heart and head. Your spirit man lives in your heart. Your head has knowledge and wisdom. But she went beyond her normal thinking. And she went to the heart. For she said within herself. Hallelujah. She made a decision. You see, what's on the inside, that will change what is on the outside. And we have to learn that the smallest effort of belief will cause God to respond. And that's why when she activated her faith, when she said within herself, if I can just touch his clothes, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just touch something of him, I'll be healed. Man. 12 years and I've got worse. And she had to literally crawl her way through people pressing against Jesus. I wonder how many times she got her hand stepped on or somebody would kick her trying to get her out of the way. Not knowing what was going on. You see, faith is active. Faith isn't something that is dormant. You see, your mind will say, maybe you will, and maybe you won't. Sometimes God does, and sometimes God doesn't. Well, that's not what the Bible tells us. Because it says, all the promises of God is yea and amen. Yes, and so be it. And this woman, she took what was inside that thing. She probably heard about Jesus touching people and healing them. You see, a lot of people were around about, and it's like church. A lot of people will be in churches today. They're thronging the presence of God, but are they touching God? That touch is what makes the difference. See, we like things done a certain way. And that's why I said, people come to church, but how many actually come to touch? Uh, touching Jesus will change your life. Faith touches Jesus. Throwing in God might make you feel good for a moment, but a touch with faith will change you. Now, I know, I, listen, we've learned from experience. We, our, one of our good friends and uh, her and her husband, they live down in Florida now, and uh, 
I, I used to call this Holy Roller. <laughs> Alita. And it's because of her we learned a whole lot. Amen. We learned a whole lot. Been in a lot of different churches. I, I mean, we had been in churches that they'd have to walk with us out at night time. Make certain we get in our vehicle and get going. We, I've been in services that had maybe 20 people, and I've been in services that had eight to 10,000 people. And, uh, you know, I learned there's a difference between going to touch Jesus and just going to feel good. I remember a time when our daughter had got out and graduated from uh, 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 school down in uh, Hamptonville, North Carolina. And uh, uh, she told that they was having a, a camp meet out in Wilkesburg. And one know if we go and I told my mentor, Jim Covey, I said, uh, Jim, they having a tent revival out there in Wilkesburg. You want to go? Yeah, we'll go. So they was me and Jim, Judy, and Tabitha, and him. And we went out there. And uh, it, it was crowded. And once the minister got up to minister, now me and Jim, we had our notebooks. We had our Bible, we had our notebooks, and we was ready to take notes. And there was people running yeah. back and forth. Yeah. Back, they do laps around the tent. Yeah. Come right up between the chairs and the pulpit. Yeah. And this went on. The, the music went on. This went on for two and a half hours. Then they gave a benediction, our call, and it's over. And I look at Jim. Jim looked at me and I said, where's the word at? He said, that's what I was trying to feel, figure out. Didn't hear no preaching. Saw a lot of running. People were feeling good. Woo, hallelujah. Run hard as they could. Shout, woo, praise God. Had heard no word. We opened our Bibles and never seen nothing preached. Mister never opened his Bible. But people were thronging to be there. Yeah. It was packed. That's probably a couple hundred, at least two or three hundred people there. And you think, it's the word. I'm a word person. You gotta get the word. Amen. The word is more important than than the singing. Amen. Worship is important. Amen. The word is what will set you free. And you have to be able to, to get that word in you. See, just like she wasn't supposed to touch nobody because she was considered unclean. But yet Jesus didn't condemn her, did he? The religious people said, well, just certain people can come here. Anybody's welcome here. I don't care. If you don't, I don't care. If you're a Muslim, you're welcome here. Amen. I'll give you the word. Hopefully you'll get set free. Amen. They just deceived. Amen. They don't care what your lifestyle is. You'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It is a process. Because the more you hear the word, it should build your faith, and the faith shall change your life. See, faith is marvelous. Faith isn't selfish. Faith can move mountains. See, there's been times that I knew something was going on before it ever happened. Because a lot of times Jesus would just show me things. 
There was times before cell phones. How many of y'all remember life before cell phones? <laughs> and we lived, didn't we? Amen. <laughs> I mean, now you can't you can pry a cell phone from a dead body. <laughs> Because they can't get it out of your hand before rigor mortis sets in. And it's there. Bury me with my phone. <laughs> you see? Before cell phones. Many of a time. God would speak to me and I would start praying for certain people. And come to find out there was a reason for that because at that time, at that moment, morning, noon, night, something was going on and I had to pray so that God would interfere. I don't know how many of y'all remember about last week. One of the things that taught is that, you know, people often said, well, God's in control. No, God's put the control in us. Amen. We have to ask God Amen. to move on our behalf. We have the ruling authority. If you watched Tuesday and Wednesday's teaching, you'll find that We've been given the ruling authority back when Jesus completed his mission here on earth. His death, burial, and resurrection and ascended to heaven. Restored us with ruling authority. And the moment that we accept him, then it opens the door for us to be endowed with the power of his might so that we can tell the devil what to do. Amen. We can tell sickness what to do. Amen. We, if we say within ourselves, in our heart, we got to be in the spirit and touch Jesus, not just Amen. get there assembled. We have to touch him. You know, there, there's an old saying, I used to, I think when I first started telling it was when Larry and Carol was here, Matthews, and uh, I said, "There's one." I told them, "I said, there's one thing about Galax, Grace, and Carol. There is no secrets." Right. <laughs> not. And I told them also, I said, "You'll find out that you'll be around people, and they know they're telling you a lie. They know that you know that they're telling you a lie." And they will still tell you a lie. And they found it out. Because I remember, oh, it had been, it'd been several years when I first told them that. And they had visited uh, uh, some people out in Baywood and uh, very talented. They could sing and all that. And had invited them to come to church hoping that we could increase our uh, praise team at that time and uh, and Carol said you know we finally witnessed what you had been telling us because when as soon as we asked this couple to come we knew that they had no intention of showing up and they knew that we knew that and they still sat there and said, oh, we'll be there. We'll be there. Yes, we'd just love to join y'all. You see, a lot of times, our mind does not reflect faith in our heart. You know, uh, nothing's hid from God. God's just waiting on people to touch him. Of all those people that were throwing in God, not a one of them touched him like that woman did. She touched him with faith. And that's why we have to learn. That's why 
The only thing that stopped Jesus in his tracks was the woman whose faith touched him. Oh my. Now, if he's Jair, uh, Jairus, how would you feel? Matthew says she's dead. Mark and Luke says she has died. And you, and you worship Jesus and you bow down and you're ruler of the synagogue. You know that when word gets out that you, that you went and bowed down to Jesus, they're going to kick you out of the synagogue. Religious people don't want you to get in touch with the Lord. And here came a divine intervention. Right in the middle of Jairus taking Jesus for his daughter to be healed. Jesus stopped because one woman touched him while everybody else was pushing up against him. We do that. How many of y'all ever get somewhere that's real crowded and you have to push your way through the crowd? Been there and done that. And you know you can't tell who touched you. Because unless you felt something go out of you, you know, uh, That's why there's a difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. I shared this one time before, and I'm going to share it again because it's like one of my friends that uh, went to church here when I was a teenager and uh, was a truck driver, and we were running together many, many years ago, uh, taking sawdust from Dixon's down to Sanford to uh, to uh, Sanford Brick Company. And as we was going down 421, uh, we got talking and he said, you know, he said, Rose said, I got a program on, on the Hills for radio. And the other day, another minister said, he just flat chewed me out. He said, now, you know, we raised, we raised Baptist teaching, once saved, always saved. And I said, now, do you understand what he's talking about? He said, no, I never could figure it out. I said, the danger in telling once saved, always saved is if a person got a head knowledge but didn't get a heart knowledge. Because if their heart doesn't change, if their life doesn't change, they had a thought, but they didn't get a conversion. And that's why when a person truly gets born again, they don't keep going in the same direction. They don't keep doing the same things. They change and start saying, God, I want you. I want more of you. And I said, that's why he chewed you out. I said, that's why I don't teach that because God knows the heart, and the heart is where the new birth starts. You see, you can think a lot of things, but it's when it's in your heart. Your spirit man knows, then something will happen. Head knowledge won't get you results a lot of time. It might if you're if you're uh, mechanically inclined or if you have the knowledge of how of whatever you're doing but see she said within herself the faith of her heart you remember in Ephesians this past week I taught on the shield of faith the shield of faith is that it guards your spirit man the helmet of salvation helps you keep your thoughts going in the right direction and the sword is the, of the Spirit is the Word of God. So she didn't get in a hurry because she had to crawl to get close to Jesus. See, that's, uh, 
your head will rest judgment for whether God will or whether God won't. The Bible tells me my God is the same today Amen. as he was then, as he will be forevermore. And the God that healed them back then will heal today just the same he will tomorrow. He doesn't change. And so that's one of the problems with church people. They'll throne God. They'll come to church, but haven't touched God. I mean, it's like you take people come to church. Do they smell right? Do they dress right? Do they look right? Do they have the same color skin? It's it's not the outward. It's the inward. That's what God wants is the inward. The religious will judge by all of that. But a person in touch with God, they won't judge the outward appearance, but what's inside. I remember when I was out at uh, Raymond Bible Training Center back in uh, 96, Six and uh, uh, the winter Bible seminar, and that's before Kent Hagen went to be of the Lord. And he said, People often say, uh, Brother Hagen, say, How do you know who's the most? Good Christian in your church. He said, Well, he said, I don't look and see how loud they shout. He said, I don't look and see how many runs to make around the church or if they're holy rollers. He said, the best way, just spend a few days with them. Spend a week with them. Watch them when they're home. Watch them when they're in work and see how they do. See if there's a change. Living for the Lord on Sunday and living for the devil on Monday. Or are they the same every day? He said, then you'll find out the right one. Considering all the people that thronged Jesus, only one person got healed as Jesus was going to Jairus' house. Do we understand that it is when we touch Jesus that things will change in our life? We're to fight the good fight of faith. We can't let the mind stop the spirit of faith. That's why I said, according to religion, she shouldn't have never touched Jesus. That's like the other week when I preached about the leper. Jesus shouldn't have never touched the leper because that was an absolute load of it. And yet he did. Because he knew what they needed. When did she get that faith? When did she get that faith? Her faith was born before she was made whole. Her faith was active. And when opportunity came for her faith that was on the inside of her, she put it into action that forever changed her situation. The disciples, they couldn't understand Jesus. Yet when Jesus was touched with faith and he felt that virtue go out, Mm -mm. Oh my. You know, how many of y'all ever had the Spirit of God? You know, Spirit of God's inside of you, but how many's ever had the Spirit go before you? Do you know you know what I'm talking about? You ever had the hairs on your arm or on your head just stand yeah. up when you just felt the Spirit of God? Amen. You know, Job said, and my flesh pricked when the Spirit passed by. You see, a lot of times, it's just like I feel the Spirit of God moving inside of me right now. 
is because I want to touch Jesus. Not just be here and give a few words and everybody shake hands, go home smiling and be happy. We're here so that we can touch God and leave different than the way that we came. See, that's, as a pastor, that's what my desire is, that every time people come in to this house of worship, they leave a little bit changed than when they came in, and they keep that changed position with God. You know, uh, I thought about uh, the first time we ever went to uh, Benny Hinn uh, Convention is down in Charlotte. And we was at our home church, had a little school bus. They painted that thing white. Paint was faded on. They run all of 60 mile an hour. At 62 mile an hour, it start going pop, 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 pop. So I did a lot of praying since I was a bus driver. <laughs> and we were fully loaded. Max capacity, 50 people on that bus. Going on a Friday evening after work down in Charlotte to see Benny. And we got in there and we were up towards the balcony area. Uh, There's probably six, seven thousand people there. And down next to his altar and pulpit, they had all the sick folk, the deaf, dumb, ones in wheelchairs. And I'm sitting up there with my religious mindset. Lord, what? That would be great to see these people that can't hear receive their healing. And God busted my bone. He said, why? I said, well, Lord, so that they can hear. He said, they hear me better than you do. Because the only voice they hear is mine. I sat there and wept because God gave me a revelation that sometimes we get religious and we don't understand what goes on. What made me think of was I, I was watching a clip the other day and is a blind man had came. And he was in a place in with the owner of a business and the business owner was getting ready to be attacked. And this blind man, they were mocking, making fun of him. And he took that cane and he beat every one of them. <laughs> There's about four of them. He just completely caused he could hear. Though he couldn't see, he understood. And we sometimes we have compassion. But it's when we say within our spirit, God, I thank you for my healing. I think because I am going to touch you. You think God doesn't want to be touched? If he didn't want to be touched, why is the Holy Spirit that is within us making intercession so that we can win? Amen. Why is Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father making intercession so that we can win Amen. and receive? But we have to make faith become active and touch Jesus. We could come in here at midnight and sit here in the dark all night long. But till we touch the light switch and flip it on, nothing will happen. We have to touch Jesus 
before something will happen. And when we touch him, something is going to happen in each one of our lives. You see, when you need something, touch Jesus from the heart of faith. Don't try to throw him. I thought about uh, evangelist David Osbrook. We got to meet him and his wife down at the Fountain of Life many, many years ago. And they were doing a revival down at the Fountain of Life. And right there at North Surrey High School, they had a head-on collision. And his wife, from that point on, for about the next seven years, her spine become petrified. She couldn't be. Went to all types of doctors. They said, there's nothing we can do for you. She would, and, and David is a faith minister. I've got books by him that's just awesome. And this was back when they had the Brownsville revival. They had went down and and got the, the ministers down there uh, to pray over her. Nothing happened. They would go to revivals. They would go minister. They would go to other places and visit. And she'd go up to be prayed for. Nothing happened. They went up to uh, they, the Toronto Blessing revival took place. And uh, they went up there. Uh, Cause uh, his wife told him, said Dave said I just feel led the Lord that we need to go up there. I believe I'm going to get healed up there. And so they got up there, and they was getting ready to go to service that evening. And David's wife she went to get the iron to press his shirt, and uh, she had turned it on. And she grabbed the hot part of the iron, instantly burnt her hand. She cried out, oh, God, help me. And David come running. They put ice on it, and they was praying. And all of a sudden, her hand was healed. Her hand was healed. And that got her attention, said, God, why? Did you heal my hand and I've been praying for my back? And he told her, said, your faith is not where it needs to be. They went to service that night and she re received healing on her spine. And she went through this for about five years after it had happened down here on 89, right in front of North Surrey High School. Because I kept up with him for quite a long period of time. And that made me think as I was <laughs> studying and thinking about this is that sometimes we throw on, we try to get in the right place. We hear this is going to, because as I said, we've learned. We've been in services and it makes you feel good. But did you learn something? Did it make your faith stronger? Just as she touched Jesus, how long did it take? It says immediately she was healed. Immediately. Well, Pastor, what about so? I can't, I don't know what's in the heart. And that's like you asked me, well, Pastor, why are you why are you taking blood pressure mess? Why are you taking this vitamins and stuff? Well, I'll tell you why. I don't eat right. I don't exercise right. And so you know, you gotta you gotta learn. To take care of yourself. I'll close out with this. 
As I've said before, a good friend of ours at her home church, retired, found out he's not been. Come to church on Sunday morning, ask the church to pray for him, for his diabetes. Leave church, go up the mountain surf, drink a Pepsi or Coke, and eat pie and cake. And it ended up killing him. Stop being killed. See, he knew he had a problem. Judy knew that she had a problem when she found out that she is diabetic. Is she diabetic now? No, she don't take nothing for it. She got off her mess. She know they want to be even talk about putting her own shots. It's not. She lost weight. She won't fudge. She won't eat whole high test cake pies. It's just like they they some stuff that some of y'all post on Facebook. It's like somebody posted, oh my, <laughs> butter, Scott, chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> I said, that looks so good, but I think it might be sinful. <laughs> and see, I could eat it. As long as I give one cookie a day. If I had a dozen, they might last a bedtime. <laughs> she will make me none because I am not going to indulge in your sinful snack habits. Because she couldn't eat them. So she don't make them. And I don't ask her to. I don't try to tempt her, don't test her. I get enough of those look there once in a while. You know, just keep on. Y'all don't know her, but those that do, she's threatened me more than once to body slap. <laughs> That's yet to be why. proved that she's capable of doing it. <laughs> but see, Jesus. <laughs> on a mission to heal a dying or dead girl stop because of one woman touching are you that one person that needs to touch Jesus today are you the one that says you know there is times that we just have to get away from everything get away from everybody and have our private time with God so that we can touch him and get instructions, get understanding, get wisdom, get it so that we can apply it and turn it into knowledge. It'll change your life. Hallelujah. I want to say something. I needed this message this morning because God knows there's two things that needs to be healed in my life. God, Jesus, I'm going to touch him in his garment, and I am going to receive healing on both things. Amen. Amen. He's done out of feet. That's Jesus right. Your body. That's right. Hallelujah. All right. Well, as always, <clears throat> we'll take this opportunity for those that are here, those that are watching. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day to ask him into your life. That's one thing about, as I was talking about, our sister Priscilla that went to be the Lord this past week. As I was talking to her present pastor, he said, you know, said, she realized that dying wasn't bad. Because if you know where you're going, right. everything's all right. Amen. Amen. And I said, amen, brother. Because I, I said, the last time that I had talked with her, and I told her, I said, you know, it's not over until God says it's over. And she said, Pastor, she says, it's all right. 
And she says, I'm ready to go. Amen. Said, I, I've got a better place waiting. Amen. And she had a lot of sicknesses going on in her body that she had dealt with for quite a few years. And as her pastor, Small said, God just let me know that she had really had things right with him. Amen. And that's what happened. Amen. I said, that's right, because she's done preached her. All we got to do is just share the goodness of the Lord Amen. and say, so if you've never accepted Jesus or if you backslid on God, right now is the greatest time that you'll ever have to make things right. Right where you sit, and whether you're at home, whether you're in here, let's just pray this simple prayer together. Father God, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask you, Father, to forgive me of all my sins, all my trespasses, everything that I've done wrong. And Lord, as you forgive me, I believe that also that what Jesus you paid for on that cross so that I could receive the Holy Spirit as well. So fill me with your Holy Spirit that from this day forward, I can live for you and serve you. And I believe it in my heart and I confess it with my mouth that you're my Lord and Savior from this day on. And I thank you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer and you believed it in your heart, you believed it within you. Know that your life is getting ready to change. Right now. Immediately. You catch us Tuesday night, Wednesday night, 6.30 on Facebook, and then later posted on YouTube. Our teaching. We're going to try to finish chapter 6 of Ephesians. It'll be 27 studies of one little book that don't have but six chapters in it. And they, this past week was as, as important as anything. So join us, come and be with us, corporate worship, and in the presence of God. God bless. Amen.